It's there we go. Leo, do you want to give a quick introduction of yourself and then I'll take it away? Yeah, sure thing. So good to meet everyone. I see some uh, familiar faces from, from Founders Camp, I think. Um, I'm Leo. I, I look after our VC partnerships for, for the UKI for Deal. Um, and I'm here essentially as, a, as an extra resource for you guys. If anything, when it comes to international expansion, looking to hire abroad, wondering what salaries are, that sort of thing, treat me as a, you know, as a extra resource and uh, happy to help out where I can. Great. Thanks for that. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see this? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Matt Manette. I'm the country lead and head of expansion for the UK and Ireland at Deal. Um, prior to joining Deal, I was actually um, someone that that uh, one of our current clients, Shopify, sent over from Canada to the UK to open up their UK and EMEA office. So the first over the first sent over on the ground, um, been here seven years, realized that it's not minus 35 or 40 in the middle of the winter and I just have to deal with the rain. So I never left. Um, prior to joining Deal, I helped a late stage company uh, get acquired and sold off a part of that. And then ultimately I was looking for a company to lay my head um, and Deal came along and loved the proposition. And when I joined Deal, there was only I think, 230 people within the organization. And fast forward to today, we have roughly 3,900 employees in 105 different countries. So we've grown quite a bit. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Deal, I'll give you a very quick level, high level kind of introduction to us. We're a pretty young company. Um, I don't think it's a secret that everyone kind of hears the buzz that we're the fastest growing tech company of all time. And again, I'm not sure who's keeping track of every single uh, tech company that's ever been created in the last, you know, 2000 plus years, but we'll take that accolade any day. Um, again, we were founded by a YC in 2019. Fast forward today, we have 25,000 customers, 120, actually it's 128 entities set up internationally right now that our clients can use. We have a valuation of 12 billion. We've done just over 500 million in ARR. And again, a company that drinks its own champagne and really kind of you know, lives and breathes what it is that we do for our clients as well with over 3,000 staff in 105 different countries all working 100% remote. But I guess what's what's kind of got us there, right? So back in the early 2019 days, we effectively were created to help uh, clients or, or companies hire and onboard global contractors and actually pay them via crypto. Um, thank God uh, our two co-founders didn't stick on that bandwagon and just go the crypto route because we probably wouldn't be here today in all honesty. Um, and we ultimately hit this inflection point where a lot of the clients that were using Deal were so happy with the contractors and so happy with the platform that they started asking us if it was possible to actually transition these people over to full-time employees, even though they didn't have the necessary entities set out internationally to actually allow for this. So we had to quickly think of a way to do this, and we ultimately launched employer of record. So that's a, effectively the ability to go ahead and hire and pay full-time employees anywhere in the world when you do not do not have an existing office. So we use our 120 different entities to hire your you know, talent to it, and then effectively contract them back out to you. We take care of all the, the, behind, the behind the scenes, and you still take care of the day-to-day -day management of that individual. Very similar to that inflection point, we saw the global contractors being made to full-time employees. Again, we've had a lot of clients as of late come to us and say, Matt, deal, we have you know, 500, 200 people spread out across all of these different regions. We want to go ahead and actually open up our own offices now because it's better economies of scale, but we don't have the resources, their know-how of actually running payroll. Can you help us with that? So obviously being a company that's built our own internal payroll teams, we thought to ourselves, well, why don't we just go ahead and offer our own payroll solution that we use for ourselves to our clients. And now we have obviously a global payroll solution. So we're really quickly becoming, as I say it in a crude term, a one throat to choke for everything kind of HR and payroll. Uh, so we're really disrupting the market and ultimately we offer auxiliary services as well, like mobility solutions, the ability to go ahead and move people from one country to another via visas and, and kind of those sorts of requests. You have the HRIS that's built into the platform as well. So we're seeing a lot of companies rip and replace a lot of their you know, tech stack to just use one point of contact being deal. And then we also, also offer entity setup and maintenance and um, you know professional services that clients may need through the life cycle and different stages of their growth as well. Um, so kind of taking care of everything regarding HR and payroll and compliance. 
And we have a couple really good logos to kind of show for it from Shopify to Nike, to Revolut, to Klarna, to Notion, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, again, 25,000 customers ranging from the smallest of companies in the SMB space, um, hiring their first employees to the biggest and the baddest uh, in all of the land. So quite a bit um, that we've done over the last little bit, um, but won't beat this. Again, we can go ahead and open it up to questions towards the end regarding our growth story if it is of interest to anyone. But what I wanna cover a little bit in detail is some of the questions you actually shared um, were uh, something that I wanted to give a, a kind of high level insights into. So I put together a quick agenda. The first is gonna be kind of an overview of global hiring and kind of a report that we put together and how we actually got that methodology. So I'll share that with you via the hiring insights because it does cross off a lot of the questions that you had regarding uh, you know, pay different regions that are ultimately hotbeds for talent and so on. Uh, but we'll then go through the remaining pre-shared questions and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, the deck should only take about 25, 30 minutes, so tons of time for questions. I do want to make this as interactive as possible, so I don't know if there is an option for people to like put up hands or anything along the lines of that, but if you want to, feel free to just cut me off. I won't take it personally, or I am keeping an eye on the meeting chat, so you can always pop it in there, and Leo can go ahead and interrupt me um, if, you're, uh, if you're too afraid to, but again, won't take it personally, like it when it's interactive. So let's get going. So global hiring overview. So I think that the trend of global hiring is often, you know, often something that is potentially uh, not really globally sourced. Uh, you know, a lot of companies are ultimately taking, you know, bias information or not really having a holistic view of, you know, what's actually going on across different markets. But again, with our own in-house employees and being able to service you know, 25,000 plus customers, we have a ton of data points across the globe. Um, so we've actually taken a look at over 300,000 contracts, our 20,000 plus customers, or over 500,000 additional data points from third-party sources that we work with. Um, we have a deal lab and basically uh, a massive uh, network of individuals that we actually work with um, across different countries, states, cities um, that have provided some of this information. And ultimately this is how we ultimately get some of this information as well. So um, anything that has uh, under 50 workers or contracts as of December 2023, we didn't actually include it into this data because it does actually kind of, uh, you know, shadow it or, or not provide a, a clear view quite as much as we'd like. So this is how we came up with some of these numbers. Um, and let's get into it. So hiring insights. Um, so I think it's always really important to talk a little bit about what's good in the market. I think, you know, coming out of last year, there was a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of question marks about what was going on. We saw some of the fastest and the biggest companies that have grown uh, over the last couple of years ultimately hit with, uh, you know, massive redundancies from, you know, behemoths like the Salesforces, the, you know, Metas, the, the so on and so forth saw a lot of top talent ultimately uh, go ahead and lead the business. And I think a lot of people were unsure of what would happen in 2024, but ultimately it's looking uh, much more positive than I think a lot of people would have expected. Um, so looking at last year's data, um, hiring in the UK by, sorry, hiring of UK talent by international companies increased by 8.4% in 2023. So it was looking uh, much more positive uh, than we previously saw. Um, obviously, UK talent most likely hired by US, UK, Swedish, Canada, and French companies. If we think about kind of the, 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 you know, the main attraction of the UK, so to speak, is that for a lot of regions that are outside of, of uh, you know, EMEA, um, it's kind of the doorstep to Europe, right? Ultimately, it's a hotbed for tons of talent. It's a melting pot of different languages, different cultures, uh, different skill sets. So UK is all ultimately one of the hottest places to go ahead and hire talent. Uh, I remember, uh, again, <laughs> growing up, my parents always said, oh, if you go ahead and work in, you know, Toronto, Canada, or London, the UK, like that's how you know you made it. Um, so I guess uh, to my parents, uh, I, although I'm not a doctor or a lawyer, I've made it just because I've had to, you know, relocate to, to the UK for work. Um, so uh, so that's always a positive. But ultimately, a lot of companies look at that, right? Ultimately, if you're going to go ahead and crack the European market, you need to hire, obviously, in the UK. After that, it's typically French. After that, it's typically, you know, the doc or, or German-speaking regions just because it's so nuanced and unique. In terms of most popular roles for UK workers, we're seeing software engineer, account executives, software developers, marketing manager, and data analysts take the top spots as well. Uh, in terms of factors growing hiring regions uh, domestically and abroad, EMEA and APAC 
uh, are were leading uh, coming out of last year. Uh, NAM and Latin America take the the top three. Not a whole lot of you know change um, from twenty twenty two. Uh, just a couple of pivots in terms of spots where Amia dropped to the four spot, although it's off the 2023 report. EPAC, LATAM, Amia, and NAM were 2022's fastest growing high ring regions. So again, talent continuously uh, is um, you know top in these regions. So I don't foresee us going ahead and seeing it. And some of the data that we're actually seeing in 2024 is almost spot on to 2023. Uh, in terms of high ring. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. A couple of questions in the chat if um if you haven't seen them already. Uh I have uh yeah, I saw the growth story, uh, especially winning some of those big name brands. I'll take that towards the end of the QA, just because it's a little bit different to the uh to uh the, the topic of the hiring insights, but I like to find out some of the growth big brands onboarding is based on acquisition strategy. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit of the strategy behind that as well. So so not a problem there. Is that the are those questions you were referring to, or is there maybe another chat that I'm not seeing with my split view? Those are the ones just checking. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Again, we can get into the nitty-gritty and the, the strategy of like how we're going ahead and landing these big logos and and you know, I'll try to share some tips and tricks and and what we typically see. Um, in terms of countries with the most workers on deal, this might be surprising to a lot of people, but from 2022, it went from obviously North America focus with the US to 2023, a big focus on the Philippines. Um, and I think it's pretty interesting to actually dig into the reason why behind this. We're seeing more companies obviously uh, faced with economic slowdowns are potentially tightening the purse strings where they're looking at ultimately hiring top talent. However, they cannot afford it in some of the key EMEA or North American markets. So what they're doing is actually hiring very skilled English speaking individuals um, in the Philippines to go ahead and take care of a lot of the uh, kind of entry level work. So that could be from, uh, you know, call center agents, it could be to virtual assistants, it could be uh, accountants, it could be a, a wide range of things. Um, but ultimately, we're seeing uh, a massive amount of hiring happen there. And we're not talking about companies coming to us and hiring one, two, three, four, or five people. We're talking about some people going ahead and doing career days where they're effectively building out a call center with 500, 1,000 people over a 48-hour interview spree. Uh, so it's pretty crazy to see some of the clients go ahead and do this and ultimately leverage deal um, to go ahead and hire and pay these individuals. So who's hiring in the Philippines the most? Uh, the UK. Obviously, a hotbed. We see big companies like the Vodafones and the Threes go ahead and potentially hire, you know, mass agents over there. Uh, Australia again, you know, right on their kind of doorstep from an offshoring perspective, and then of course the U.S. as well. And as I mentioned, most popular roles are assistant, data accountant, uh, and so on. U.S. Um, you know, a little bit of a change there going into last year. Uh, so I won't take too much into that. But again, in 2023, the second spot is. Uh, the U.S. hiring quite a bit in the Netherlands, Japan, and Ireland. Uh, marketing, quality assurance engineer, accountant seem to be the big ones here. Uh, for the U.S., um, we're seeing a lot of uh, people actually relocate from uh, North America to the Netherlands, inflating that number quite a bit just because they have a fairly uh, easy visa process. It's pretty easy to go ahead and get a visa approved. So they can go ahead and potentially relocate much quicker than to get into the UK or other regions. So we see that uh, happen quite a bit. Um, Japan, again, obviously from a cultural nuance perspective, uh, a lot of companies want to go ahead and expand into the Asian market, uh, good quality of life and great talent. And then Ireland, I don't think it's a secret. A lot of US companies, specifically the big ones, like to go ahead and take advantage of some of the tax uh, breaks in Ireland, being the LinkedIn's, the Salesforce's, the Shopify's, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, sometimes use deal to go ahead and hire over there through different agencies and partners. Um, so not a big surprise. Um, in terms of terminations, again, I think we saw quite a bit of slowdowns um, or, or kind of, you know, quite a bit of news pieces come out last year regarding a lot of change within the termination market. So uh, last year we saw uh, individuals in influencer marketing, content writer, consultant, uh, go through mass redundancies. Um, however, coming into this year, we saw account executives, community managers, and content creators actually uh, slow down a little bit. A really interesting trend that we actually saw last year uh, towards the end of the year is that a lot of the individuals in this kind of bucket here that will actually face mass uh, redundancies actually rebounded quite well. Um, 
not all, but quite a bit. So what that means is that we saw a lot of companies that were potentially using deal to hire these individuals as full-time employees. They went through the redundancy phase and ultimately these uh, types of roles came back onto the deal platform as contractors. And what we noticed is that a lot of these individuals actually took on multiple projects at one time. So rather than work for a single employer, they might've worked with two or three different um, uh, companies via contract um, bids. So they would potentially go ahead and work three different projects, but ultimately go ahead and cover uh, what they were making before. We actually saw a 3% higher uh, wage or, or income uh, from the year previously for a lot of these rebounded employees. So although it was quite doom and gloom in a stressful period, we did see a lot of people actually come out of it um, with a higher earning uh, potential uh, year over year. In terms of this year, again, I think the positive is we've already seen a pretty sub significant slowdown in terminations. So again, not all doom and gloom, not everyone's doing, going through mass redundancies. We're seeing a little bit of a boomerang effect now. And it's nice to see um, these things slow down and things return to normal, so to speak. Uh, in terms of salaries, last time I gave this presentation, I had my entire sales team sitting in the crowd watching, and then I got a couple of taps from people asking for raises just because uh, <laughs> apparently that's what, that's what you do when all the other markets are giving increases. Um, but again, not all doom and gloom. We're actually seeing uh, some markets actually increase um, salaries across 2023 and well into 2024. So EMEA is at 7% 7, 7 increase, Latin America at 2%, APAC at uh, 1%, North America being still in the negative again, as a lot of the big companies are still trying to kind of return or increase hiring. We're still seeing the market ultimately have a lot of vacancies uh, or a lot of individuals looking for, for jobs. So a little less competitive or much more competitive than it used to be. Um, so a lot of companies don't need to pay the big dollars as they used to, uh, specifically in hotbed regions and cities. Uh, teaching up 24%, sales up 8%, software engineers and content up 3%. Teaching is a really interesting one. Seeing a lot of uh, teachers ultimately, again, go ahead and take multiple forms of employment via the deal platform through both contractor and full-time employee status. Uh, virtual teaching, virtual uh, tutor, et cetera, goes ahead and does quite well. In terms of specific roles, consulting is up 6 uh, or 7%, we should say, uh, four and a half points for content, three for design, and then two for product as well. So again, um, if you're in these roles or potentially have this type of talent, it's always interesting to keep an eye on what the market trends are because other people might come knocking and offering a little bit more for these individuals, especially as you hunt for uh, specific people. Um, most popular places to get visas. So I think one of the, the, the really interesting things is specifically working with a lot of SMBs via uh, kind of incubators or accelerators or, or, or in the VC space is that they're typically a lot more open to ultimately hiring top talent anywhere in the world versus within a smaller radius. And that's typically a couple reasons. Number one, I think everyone's well aware now that rather than go ahead and hire two uh, software engineers in London and pay them you know, an exorbitant amount of money, you could probably hire four uh, in Poland or another region for the same cost and ultimately get access to the exact same level of talent if you vet them and kind of interview them correctly. And number two is that I think everyone coming out of COVID has realized that you can get you know, a lot of work done without being within a 30 mile radius of an office or even you know, being in person. Obviously it's not you know, specific to every single role or leadership teams and so on, but I think more and more companies are more open to hiring the best talent anywhere in the world versus going ahead and hiring someone within their own backyard. As a result of that, we see a lot of top talent actually go to these countries. So the U, uh, UAE, Netherlands, France, UK, Singapore, Spain, Germany, Canada, US, and Poland. Um, so it's really interesting to go ahead and look at, you know, some of these regions. And I think, you know, the first couple um, typically kind of answer, you know, for themselves, obviously people going to the UAE to take advantage of their amazing tax benefits uh, over there. Uh, Netherlands, great quality of life in France. Um, yeah, great cheese, great wine, I guess. Um, UK, um, beautiful place as well, a little rainy. Singapore, tax benefits. Spain, great quality of life. Germany, again, um, massive kind of hotbed for obviously penetrating the dock market. No idea why Canada is on this list if you're not living uh, out west. It is damn cold, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And then, of course, the US and Poland um, still continue to, to kind of hold true in, in the top 10 for uh, 
for visas. Um, US um, has kind of fluctuated in the net of the list just because there's so many slowdowns. Um, and I see a question here, what about the refugees from Ukraine who can emigrate to many countries? Actually, that's really interesting because a lot of the larger clients that we're working with, specifically those that had both Russian and Ukrainians that ultimately fled uh, the war to go to other regions, typically took advantage of EU uh, blue cards and ultimately had support via deal to get um, visas into many of these countries. Um, we ultimately opened up a golden visa with the UAE government to allow for a lot of refugees to emigrate in uh, fairly quickly. So that's why we saw the UAE be, you know, uh, uh, fairly uh, quick and, and a very popular destination. Number one, it was very, very quick to go ahead and get it approved. And number two, uh, obviously, there's great tax benefits there. Uh, Netherlands, again, another one, France. Uh, you know, was a good one as well. Um, Spain, uh, again, very popular for uh, a lot of companies that were looking at relocating individuals from the Ukraine. And then not on this list as well, it was Portugal, right? So Portugal, again, very easy to ultimately get visas. And I guess what was really interesting with a lot of these people that were emigrating or potentially being relocated via the conflict was that a lot of companies were actually much more open to relocating them from full-time employee status to actually converting them to contractor status in order to make the uh, relocation process easier, right? So sometimes if you have a specific, uh, you know, blue card or, or whatever it is, you can ultimately enter into a country um, and be hired and, and set up a golden visa or like a, a contractor visa, so to speak, to ultimately take advantage of tax benefits. So I think it was a combination of a few things, obviously being a fairly sensitive uh, situation, but ultimately um, how to get your talent and get your people to a safe place as quickly as possible and ultimately get them the benefit that they potentially are seeking as well. So we can kind of talk a bit more about that. And we have a home mobility team that can actually talk you through and kind of answer your questions as it pertains to this as well. Really interesting to kind of see the, uh, the hotbeds here. In terms of top cities, uh, UK is obviously numero uno. So again, like I said, my parents think I'm, uh, I, I really made it here. Toronto, Canada, which I actually fled from to the UK. Um, so, you know, crossing both off the list there. Uh, San Fran um, obviously still continues to be a hot, hotbed for uh, remote workers. Buenos Aires, amazing software and tech talent uh, in Argentina, and then Madrid, Spain. Um, just a beautiful city and great place to live. Hiring by UK City, London, Manchester, Birmingham, and Edinburgh uh, are the big four there. Um, I don't think anyone's really surprised, um, but uh, but that's what it looks like in terms of where you can find top talent and where you should be open to hiring as well. Um, really interesting, and I added this one in actually, is obviously AI continues to be a massive topic for a lot of companies. Um, we see tons of companies actually approach deal to go ahead and hire AI talent. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of times they don't really know what the AI talent is going to necessarily be doing. They just know that they need to hire AI talent to stay up on uh, what the trends are. Uh, but we've actually seen a 297% increase in orgs hiring AI roles, data scientists, and software engineers from the UK since January 2022. So again, it's a very competitive space to play in, uh, hence why we're seeing an actual increase in salaries for these types of roles. Um, in terms of countries, the US, Canada, and the UK are most likely to hire from the UK specifically for these roles as well. Um, UK, in terms of roles, London, Manchester, and Bristol uh, kind of make that up with a massive, obviously, focus on uh, London being the hotbed. And then in terms of increase in UK organizations hiring AI roles since August, uh, we've seen a 42% increase. And then the UAE massive increase there at 80%, Spain, 7%, Germany, 10%, Portugal, and India as well. Um, so again, seeing more and more people ultimately go to these cities and then ultimately get hired by top talent internationally um, that are open to hiring remote talent and getting access to the best available. So really interesting trends there. I'll pause there. Um, any questions regarding some of the, the hiring and trends um, that I quickly skimmed through? I think, Matt, um... I can jump in with a few questions um, from the list that we sent over before. And then we have had a good number of questions come through the chat. And I'm sure people will have more questions um, as we go along. Ooh, love that you have it up here. Um, my first very important question for you is whether or not you use the word hotbed so much in the other presentations or if it's just, <laughs> but either way, much appreciated, love it. Fair. Um, I think it was probably drilled into my head going into this. So yeah, no, no worries. 
Perfect. Um, I think a lot of people want to hear about the deal growth story, but I think the two main things we want to cover off the back of the presentation is to dive a bit more into salary differences to that, that founders can expect. And then um, also tips on finding these employees abroad. So let's start with the latter. Um, for, I guess, hiring a technical talent or non-technical talent, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, what are the ways that you are seeing founders and startups locating this talent, especially like, let's say a founder has narrowed it down to maybe three different countries that they're interested in learning, that they're interested in looking for, probably primarily driven by um, cost of talent since everyone's early stage. Of course. What yeah. are the ways that people go about finding the top tier employees there? Yeah, that's a good question. We get asked this a lot. And I think what some people try to do or some organizations try to do is they try to paint a very broad stroke where they'll effectively open up a role and then be like, it's an open role for anywhere, right? Um, and then they'll ultimately get inundated with like hundreds or thousands of applications depending on the role. So I, what I always like to see is if you have three um, regions that are of interest for hiring, create three separate job listings. So if you're hiring a software engineer and you're open to hiring them in South Africa, um, you know, Portugal and Spain, don't open one that says, okay, I'm open to hiring someone across India and then filtering through a massive list to be like, where is this person located? Where is this person located? Create three different job postings. You'll have three different, you know, applicants that are effectively matching the criteria of that uh, region. And then you could sift through them that way. So there's two things. Number one, it actually makes it look like you have, you know, more opportunities or more jobs available, but you also get applications that are actually specific to that, uh, to that region. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice on, on both fronts and it's easier for you to sift through as well. Um, in terms, sorry, and there was a, a second point of that question. What was it? Apologies, Margaret. I think that actually covered it. It was just about, oh, maybe we could do a bit more like after you get through the applications, what are the ways of, um, I guess like doing some quality quality control and assessment, like what does that process usually look like? And also are there different expectations from job applicants depending on what country they're coming from? Like are some countries more tolerable of a full stage interview process while others want it done in, in two steps? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess this kind of ties into the kind of the deal growth story. So I'll try to kind of some like put kind of put them both into perspective. So when Shwo and Alex, our two co-founders, were effectively looking at hiring the first couple of individuals, um, um, they they were challenged with it. They were basically, you know, like who do we hire? Where do we hire them? We know that we want to go ahead and attract the best talents anywhere in the world, um, but how do we kind of narrow the scope? Uh, and and being you know to uh, well-traveled individual, Shwo is Chinese, uh, Alex is French-Israeli, um, and they basically met at MIT, and, and they started thinking back and, and looked at what projects they were involved in, and, and they thought to themselves, okay, like, who did we like working with the most? Like, what are the similarities? Are they from a specific region? Do they speak a specific language? Is it potentially a, a specific cultural nuance that really allowed us to kind of match up well? So they effectively went and sat down and they both came up with a list of different co countries of, you know, people that they, you know, work with on projects that they got along with well on a repeat basis. So that's where they started. They started thinking to themselves, okay, this is going to be the first couple of regions that we potentially hire people in. Um, so they hired uh, five individuals, uh, one in the UK, um, uh, one in France, uh, and then a couple others kind of scattered uh, across Eastern Europe that they work well with. Uh, I think three out of the five are still with Deal today. Um, so once we IPO, I'm sure they'll be very happy people. Um, but um, but ultimately, that was kind of the, the short list of how they came up with it. And ultimately, what they were thinking about is, okay, number one, who did we get along with? But um, are these individuals going to match up to the kind of culture that we're building as well? Because I think a lot of times people are going ahead and opening up roles and they're potentially getting people uh, that apply from international locations, but they're not thinking about how the company or kind of how the messaging set up, right? Because number one, it's not only about your go-to-market strategy uh, of how you're going to launch this product in the region, but it's also how is this person going to understand what values or company values you're sharing and does it align to, you know, what they're interested in or what their potential, you know, values are as well. Um, 
is the product and the mission going to be understandable to them based on the nuances of their regions? Is it something that they're going to go ahead and, you know, back and ultimately live, you know, live, breathe and, and kind of, you know, work hard on, or is it going to just be kind of a checkbox where it's a job? Because in the early stages, you want someone ultimately that's going to be kind of a jack of all trades focused on multiple things. And everyone knows, regardless if you're a software engineer or, you know, a account executive or whatever it is, if you're in a 5, 10, 15, 20 person company, you're wearing many, many hats, or you should be wearing many, many hats, because that's ultimately how companies grow, um, is by having all hands on deck. So I probably take those things into account as well. And then when you're looking at ultimately opening up these job postings and job listings, you have to take into account different you know, nuances of job scopes as well. So if you go ahead and hire a senior solution engineer, or, or, or put a job posting out there. The type of talent that may apply from, you know, the U.S. might be vastly different in terms of the talent or the skills that they've had to build that accreditation versus someone in, you know, Singapore or uh, India or, you know, one of those regions, right? In terms of what's considered senior in one place might be, you know, very different than the other. So what, what's always really important is ultimately breaking down what the scope of work would ultimately look like for this individual, rather than having like a title be the the the, the end all kind of like hook and catch and sinker, so to speak. Um, so being really really prescriptive in the job posting will ultimately help you number one not have you know millions of applications that ultimately don't fit that mold, um, but it'll also allow you to better understand. Uh, and better vet um, what your expectations are for someone in the role. Um, I think for a lot of roles as well, uh, specifically for companies that go ahead and hire very early on who aren't you know, familiar with kind of the hiring process. Hiring is very difficult, by the way. You, you know, you're probably going to make 100 mistakes before you make like one right move uh, in most cases. Um, but having um, project-based interview processes is really important for a lot of roles as well, because there's a lot of individuals that ultimately can talk a good talk. And if you're not you know, familiar with going through you know, hundreds of interviews and kind of building up that muscle, then it's always good to go ahead and have someone do a potential project, regardless if it's you know, a mock call or a demo or kind of a show and tell or potentially giving them you know, some scripts to work on in the software field, giving them something that you know that is going to be a repeater you know, ongoing problem within the business business that they're going to be working on is a great way to actually measure how successful they're going to be versus just going ahead and having a high level conversation and checking boxes. So I think those are a couple of things that you really need to kind of build in uh, and ultimately be super mindful of as you go ahead and hire internationally as well. That's super useful. There's so much good stuff in there. Um, one of the questions I have off the back of that is, so let's say a founder has done, as you suggested, narrowed in on the on three countries they're interested in hiring. They're starting with the job descriptions and then they're adding the titles on the, the different LinkedIn job adverts, let's say. Um, what's the best way to go about finding the specific job titles that they should be using in each country? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, ooh, I think it's... I, 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 I think now, right, like I, I think the way the world has opened up so vastly pre-COVID and, and kind of post, uh, or sorry, post-COVID, post-Brexit, um, is that there's typically like a, a one size kind of role that kind of crosses a lot of boxes off. But I think most of you have come across someone that you've worked with or that if you could hire anyone in the world, infinite salary, you'd probably like follow them on LinkedIn or know of them through like a network or something like that, right? Ultimately, look at their job scope, like look at what title they have, um, emulate something similar to get that that type of talent, right? I, I don't think anyone needs to recreate the wheel. You know, I've seen some, uh, you know, some companies uh, in the early stages trying to get creative and kind of like have a cool culture where they'll call, a, you know, an account executive a sales ninja. So what does a sales ninja do? Like, why are we calling them sales ninjas? They're salespeople. I just call them account executives or like, you know, salespeople, right? If they're, you know, a software developer, don't call them like software scientists or something you know off off putting right call them what they are because that's ultimately the the kind of you know jobs they're seeking and what they're going to be searching for you'd be amazed at the, the, the weird titles we see for some roles and sometimes they come to us and they ask us you know you know why uh why that is i think another thing that a lot of companies in the early stages are um you know a little bit um slow to do sometimes is um is ultimately look for specialists 
not only for that role, but in that region as well, right? If you're a North American or UK headquartered company and you ultimately want to hire someone in Eastern Europe, um, the odds that you're going to potentially go ahead or the time you're going to take to ultimately find this individual is typically going to cost you more or, or, or be a limitation than actually just going ahead and potentially hiring an agency or getting support from someone in that region that that's focused on that. And again, you know, Leo uh, and myself, we can go ahead and introduce you to, you know, talented um talent acquisition teams uh, just about anywhere in the world because we use them for for ourselves as well right so um i think a lot of times companies want to stay very lean and ultimately go ahead and find their own talent versus spending a little bit of money and getting access to someone really quickly who's ultimately kind of pre-vetted as well because ultimately you're sharing what the scope of work is going to look like with the, uh, the 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 recruiter don't shy away from that um and then ultimately use your network as well right uh, again i think everyone you know, comes across hundreds, if not thousands of people by the time they go ahead and potentially get their seed round. Um, it's super important to ultimately lean into that network and, and, you know, share, you know, challenges and ultimately ask if anyone knows of someone that would fit this mold. Um, because typically, again, uh, it's their brand on the line as well. Um, so they're not going to give you someone who's really, really bad because, you know, you know, reflect on them. So don't, uh, don't shy away from, you know, using the resources and then tried and true methods that are out there as well. Uh, let's not recreate the wheel here by any means. All right. Um, I'm going to, I have a few more questions and then I'm going to move on to questions from our founders. So please raise your hand if you want to ask a question live or put it in the chat. Um, Matt, I'm really curious, what's the trajectory for companies that decide to hire the first few roles abroad in terms of, um, I don't know, like company headquarters, like if you decide to hire your first few engineers and let's say Poland, do you see most startups doing that with the intention of then opening up an office, like a full-time office in Poland or that they want to end up relocating the engineers to London or that they're just hiring the engineers for pricing reasons and their plan after they raise, let's say a larger series A or a larger seed round would be to hire talent in London and let go of the remote employees? What does that usually look like? Yeah, I think it depends on the, the, the kind of the, you know, DNA of the company and ultimately what they're trying to accomplish. I think that the really important thing, I think in the early stages of any sort of hiring talent is also ultimately transparency, right? Like I think if you're going ahead and hiring someone that's in Poland or in a specific region, their goal is ultimately to go ahead and get paid fairly and get paid the most that they possibly can and stay in the country that they potentially are getting hired in, right? That's ultimately why they've, you know, maybe chosen to, to be there. Um, and ultimately exploring that and, and doing a little bit of, you know, Q&A and discovery in the hiring process to ask them if they're open to it. And ultimately, like, what are your plans, right? I think a lot of companies uh, try to, you know, be fairly mysterious in the early stages, again, that aren't, you know, uh, experts in, in kind of the hiring and, and interview process. And ultimately there's typically uh, a little bit of a surprise for someone that joins the company and it's maybe not as far as long or they're not really, you know, there's no onboarding process. And then six months in, it's like, Hey, you know, we actually want you to go ahead and relocate to, to London. Are you open to it? And, you know, they're, they're not. And ultimately that's a surprise to them. And then it's kind of a, a bad taste in their mouth. And ultimately you potentially have to move on and it's really costly to go ahead and find new talent. So I think first and foremost, be transparent with ultimately what you're trying to accomplish over, you know, 12, 24, 36 month kind of, you know, growth phase, assuming things go well, assuming things don't go well, um, then, you know, it's going to be status quo. There's not going to be any sort of relocations and openings of office. But I'd say for the most part, most companies that go ahead and hire, you know, remote employees in the early days, um, I think they always ultimately look at continuing to build out that, that team in that specific region. So if you go ahead and hire one, two, three software developers or engineers in Poland and things go well, you're typically going to go ahead and continue to add more heads. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily like a, a, a pinpoint on a timeline where it's, you know, okay, well, we need to go ahead and open an office and open up our own entity. It's typically like an economy to scale thing. Is it more costly to go ahead and leverage a platform or a company like Deal or to open up my own entity and maintain my entity? Do I have the resources? Do I have the payroll staff? Do I have the HR teams available to do that? So that typically answers itself pretty quickly. Uh, my mindset is always don't fix something that's not broken um, when you're kind of in the growth phase. And then once you kind of hit that, you know, size and maturity where you do want to go ahead and lock in people, lock in, you know, countries, that's when you should really make those sorts of investments and make those decisions. Um, 
but um, but I wouldn't say you know a lot of companies um, think about that too much in the early phases. It's more like okay, what milestones do we need to be at in order to go ahead and get these things done from a resource perspective, and obviously like what are the costs associated with it, right? So um, most people in kind of the the startup space um, hire continue to hire internationally with no kind of end goal uh, in mind. Again, you know, deal if you probably ask Alex and Schwo. Um, you know, when there were two people coming out of Y Combinator, um, they did talk about opening offices. Um, it just never happened because, um, kind of going back to Margaret, your, your first point, what do we see from companies? Typically the companies that hire their first, first re remote employees or continue to hire remote employees are typically the highest performing companies um, that we see, that we work with, um, because they get access to diverse opinions, diverse talent. Um, they typically launch in those regions much quicker as well, because ultimately you have the cultural nuances and the insights um, that a lot of uh, companies that are hiring inside their own kind of, you know, 30 mile radius don't have when they're launching in a market. Um, product feedback is potentially nuanced to a specific market. So it's really hard to go ahead and pivot and adjust. So again, hiring internationally, specifically in regions that you do foresee expanding uh, from a go-to-market and, and, and revenue or sales perspective um, is uh, is never a bad thing. Um, if we could do it again, we would do it the exact same way. That's good to hear because right now there's so much push I see on like Twitter from VC saying, oh, if you're not hiring in person as a startup, then like you're not serious. Like it's for some reason quite a polarizing yeah. topic and deal is obviously a perfect example of the exact opposite. Um, okay, so last question for me is, can you share a bit around salaries, any data you have on like benchmarks and what founders could expect to say, so like let's say an engineer in you know three of the top countries that people are hiring in, um, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. I don't like yeah, calling right. audience, it sounds so formal, but- <laughs> No, no worries. You know the special guests. Um, so rather than talk over specifics, um, I actually pop this up here. So you can literally scan one of these and I think Leo will we'll share it with Margaret and the team and she can pass this deck over to you. But basically if you go ahead and take your phone and just scan any of these, um, you could actually go ahead and get access to a salary calculator basically. And if you go ahead and say, I wanna hire a software engineer in India, it's gonna give you a low median and high wage for that specific role in terms of a seniority level like XYZ, right? So again, we obviously hire our own teams. We help companies hire people all over the world. So uh, in terms of specifics, it gets fairly granular. Um, so I won't talk over specifics um, just because again, this is a great tool. You can pull it up. It's on our website as well. It's free to use, but we'll give you everything. It's really funny too, because we also use this for ourselves as well. Um, so when we go ahead and potentially go ahead and hire someone, we'll ultimately use the salary benchmarks that we have access to not only internally, but what we're seeing from other companies that leverage the deal platform. So if someone comes to us, an example right now, I'm hiring someone in uh, Tel Aviv as an uh, enterprise account executive. And uh, one of the candidates earlier on was like, uh, I want this, this amount of money. And I was like, no one's paying that, that amount of money. And I'm like, here's how I know. And I showed him the calculator and we went into tons of the data, right? So I think this is a really like safe way to be grounded in what other companies are seeing, uh, specifically at your growth stage. Because again, we work with so many companies um, that are hiring their first people. And this is ultimately in line with what you should be paying and what you should be comfortable paying, right? I don't think it should be a surprise for anyone. But I'll leave this, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave that, that answer open-ended and you guys can yeah, scan away and, and uh, get plugged into it. Perfect. And yeah, we'll share this with everyone following the presentation. Um, I'm going to merge together two questions, one from Purdy and one from Darren, because uh, I think this will be a big question, but I think you can probably weave it all together. Um, Purdy said, I'd love to hear the growth story, especially winning some of those big name brands. Did deals start selling to SMEs? What was the initial, what was the strategy initially to get companies like Shopify, et cetera? How long did those relationships take to build? And then to add on to that already long question, um, I'd like to find, we have a question from Darren. It says, I'd like to find out some of the growth and big brand onboarding um. So I'd like to find out if some of the some of the growth in big brand onboarding is based on an acquisition strategy. So maybe we can just talk about like the early acquisition strategy of both big brands and SMEs. 
Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, I, I think with any company that you know has two people or five people within the first like twelve months of of kind of launching, we were very SME uh, SMB focused. Um, so effectively helping companies, specifically at a Y Combinator, actually um, hire and retain their first you know few employees um, just through kind of you know, being a, you know, product led company, we were very focused on the SMB market. Then we saw a lot of companies ultimately start creeping up and hiring more and more people. And then a couple ultimately kind of springboard a deal into, you know, what it is today and really helped us kind of shape the product. Right. Cause I think it's, it's always interesting to, you know, build a product based on what your assumptions of what the market need, but ultimately being influenced by some of your biggest logos are going to allow you to, know solve for the future so to speak so we had quite a few companies that were you know very nice uh, to us that ultimately didn't kick us out the door when we ultimately couldn't support them but fed it all back and we built it into the platform um so some of those companies became yeah like andela as an example uh, uh there's another one there that effectively does freelancer engineering that has thousands of uh, employees on teal today um based in south africa but um i think it is andela isn't it i think i believe it is but um um, early days, really SME focused. And again, just through kind of yeah, growth, we st started seeing these companies go into the mid-market space and ultimately that allowed our go-to-market to move upstream. Uh, so we probably over kind of over, uh, I want to say focused a little bit in the early days, trying to like really force our way into kind of the mid-market enterprise space. And ultimately some of our product just wasn't ready. It wasn't until we, you know, slowed down, so to speak, to speed up where we ultimately really focused on some of our key clients uh, in terms of what their asks were and really doubled down and focused on fixing some of the gaps that we saw where we then could go back and say, okay, we have this reference, we have this ha happy client that is at 400 employees or 500 employees. Oh, next thing we know, they got, you know, hundred million. Now there are 700 employees or a thousand employees in a household name. So we're really able to go ahead and attach ourselves to some of the great clients uh, that we were already working with to ultimately go upstream. Um, really interesting though, um, earlier on kind of to the, the big names, the Shopify's, the Nikes and so on, it was a really kind of nuanced um, project where we saw a lot of these companies come to us. Oh, I'm looking at relocating five people from, you know, the US to, to Spain because they're exec talent and ultimately they're going to quit if we don't let them work for a beach, right? Like those are some of the requests that we got earlier or we've just gone through, you know, an acquisition and we don't have, you know, an entity in Mauritius, can you go ahead and support global payroll there, right? So early days, it was ultimately those kind of one-off smaller projects and that ultimately allowed us to build a lot of credibility and trust solving those problems for big names. And that allowed us to go ahead and expand our presence within, you know, the region. I think the biggest challenge specifically moving upstream is just getting companies to know who you are and ultimately knowing what it is that you offer. So being able to solve a fairly small problem, then over time educating not only the points of contact, but other individuals within their business of what the, you know, the wealth of experience we could bring to the table has led to us to continue to grow and, and kind of expand our reach within the business as well. So it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it took, again, I've been a deal for three years. Um, when I got here, I think the biggest client was maybe 250 or 300 employees. Now we have, you know, clients that are coming knocking on our door that have 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 employees, right? So it's not an overnight thing. Um, but I think if you solve for your clients uh, in the early days and, and really keep that feedback, feedback loop open, it's going to continue to allow you to, to move upstream quicker and quicker just because you've you've already solved for what the demand is, right? So that's I what think I think we could do an entire session just on that and like how you can grow with your with your customers. Um, Probably, yeah, I, it's a big one. I, I'm, I'm curious to know, what did that feedback look like? Did you have quarterly or monthly calls scheduled with the customers? Like what were you using to get that feedback? <laughs> and then how did you weigh up the pros and cons of building out whole products for Yeah, in the early days, I'd love to say that, uh, you know, it was... Uh, like getting on like bi-weekly calls or monthly calls. I think in the early days we were like, we were so lean. Ultimately we were selling an onboarding client so quickly. We didn't even have like the customer support infrastructure needed to actually support a lot of this. Um, so it was like Slack, like we all really opened like Slack up. I still have, you know, calls on a daily basis at like midnight from, you know, a CEO of like a company that we onboarded two and a half years ago that is launching a new company and is in a different time zone and has a question. So uh, we were getting feedback from all angles. So Slack, WhatsApp, 
LinkedIn, email. Um, you know, I've never worked at a company where, you know, people are this responsive to client feedback and ultimately escalations. Cause the thing is an escalation is, is although, you know, it's typically when something's not going right, it's a great way to ultimately fix that problem for the future as well. So, you know, even now, um, if there's an escalation, both, you know, our CEO or COO, the co-founders, they're all, you know, all hands on deck. It doesn't matter if you're a five person company or a 5 million person company. Um, it's, uh, it, it's how we solve things. So yeah, the feedback, feedback loop was just, we asked for them to just hit us from all angles. It was a very overwhelming in all honesty, coming from a company like Shopify with, you know, 25,000 employees at the time where, you know, feedback loops were fairly closed and ultimately it influenced product where you can message the CEO, he would receive the message. There would be an engineer on it first thing in the morning and by noon, the next day it would be fixed or rolled out. Right. Like that's, that's the, the, the pace at which we worked in the early days. Um, it's now coined, uh, you know, a term called deal speed, because effectively, if you, you know, ask us to do something or we need to do something, we'll turn it around within 48 hours. So it's, it's pretty crazy. And we have another question from Barack. Half of this has already been answered first half. Um, it's new, really good question. Um, how did you initially approach your pricing when selling to both SMEs and large companies? Yeah, great, great question. I think that the, the concept of like what it is that we were offering in the early stages wasn't like a new concept to the market. However, it was like an antiquated, you know, thing, right? Ultimately, the ability to go ahead and hire and pay without employees anywhere in the world was typically done via like agencies. And they would ask to collect documents on like email. And again, this is something that's been around since like the 80s, right? So we ultimately looked at this in the early stages of, yeah, uh, Brexit and COVID to say, okay, how can we go ahead and help companies hire and pay remote employees now that they've relocated or potentially are open to this sort of concept, create a platform or automated way of doing it. So we do quite a bit of kind of market um, research uh, from a pricing perspective. But what we realized is that a lot of companies were effectively charging um country specific pricing. So if you hired someone in India, it would be, you know, $1,000. If you hired someone in North America, it would be $200. If you hired someone in somewhere else, it would be a different price. Oh, if you hired them that, you know, if you hired them where they were on a half a million salary, well, we charge 10% of that to maintain that. Oh, we charge 1% if they're in this country. And it was really complex. Like there was no really easy way for clients to understand number one, how can I forecast this into my budget from a growth perspective? And number two, like, why is this so complex, right? So we ultimately want us to go ahead and charge the same fee, regardless of the type of employee, the salary or the country. So we basically just wanted to take something that's overly complex from like a document collection and onboarding process and simplifying that, but simplifying the price that is allocated to that as well. So again, companies can say, okay, I want to hire someone in India. Well, I know it's $599. Want to hire someone in Australia? Okay, I know it's $599. I want to give someone a million dollar salary. Okay. I still know it's $599, right? Like those are the things that we really tried to solve for. Um, and it's been great because yeah, there's not a whole lot of negotiation as a result of it. So it saves up a lot of our time. Fabulous. Um, any last questions? I have one, unless we have someone from our cohort who wants to ask one, give you like 10 seconds to raise your hand. Okay. I'll ask a question. Um, Leo, we actually had a good conversation last time we met about competition. And one of the things that Hori and I had noticed was that your competition has uh, like two, three years ago, we saw so many adverts from companies doing something similar. And now it seems like you guys are have like are well established as like the leader in the market. Um, ha has that been intentional? Like, have you specifically focused on outpacing the competition or have you just been like, you know, keeping your eyes on your own lane and and doubling down on on what you've been doing yeah, that's a good question this actually kind of ties into the growth story as well in, in terms of what makes deal like a massive differentiator and ultimately what's what's allowed our, our headcount to grow so quickly over the last like five years so when we were coming into the space a lot of companies would essentially outsource like hr outsource legal or outsource a lot of the the, the kind of behind the scenes of what it is that they were offering. And we didn't want to do that. We tried it in the early stages and ultimately realized that it was just a really poor client experience. So then we opted to open up our own entities. But whenever you open up an own entity, you effectively need a certain accreditation in that region to be able to offer some of our services. And that means that you need to hire HR people and tax people and potentially legal people behind the scenes to support this. 
So in the early days, we were just looking at being able to provide the best client experience possible. So we ultimately had to hire these people. And as a result of it, uh, and ultimately as a result of us receiving so much funding, we were able to do this quite quickly. A lot of our competitors didn't do that. So they were still getting outsourced you know, uh, resources. So you go to them with a question, they'd ship you off to an outsourced HR person. That outside HR person would ship you to a legal person. So there was kind of like seven degrees of separation from you know, the actual company that you'd actually contracted with. And it wasn't a great experience. We're talking like weeks of like feedback loops to just get an answer to, can I, you know, hire and pay this person or include this phrase in their, their job scope. You know, we could ultimately turn that around within minutes, if not, you know, an hour max, right? Because again, everything's closed in, in our own environment. So we really focus on that kind of client experience. And ultimately as a result of it, um, we just were known for being the best in, in the market and fast forward to today as a result of it, not only being able to build, again, that sort of support, we've actually leveraged that support and the nuances to launch additional products like global payroll and so on. So that's why we're seeing deal continue to grow and be able to help companies at all different life cycles. Meanwhile, a lot of our competitors are still focused on what we were doing five years ago, hiring contractors or hiring full-time employees, right? So um, that's really helped us kind of springboard is just being really client obsessed and client focused and solving for, you know, the now and ultimately, you know, paving the way for where we wanted to go. Um, so I think that's, that's been a really like important kind of lesson in, in learning for us, uh, not only internally, but how to ultimately, you know, take over the market. It's, it's nice. It worked well. Um, we've also, also grown via acquisition as well. So obviously there's, you know, been some product gaps that we've, you know, realized it's more uh, advantageous for us to go ahead and buy a company that focuses on that and building it ourselves, just so that way we can stay, you know, in the top spot. Um, but it didn't, didn't just happen overnight. Fantastic. Um, we have to wrap it there. Um, but founders, we have an amazing discount from Dale. We'll be sharing the details of that. I think we should actually shared it in the WhatsApp chat last week um, and on the platform, but we'll recirculate it with our follow-up email after today's session. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Dill Team, for joining us. And now we have another session on growth that Purdy is going to leave so we can stop the recording here. Wave goodbye to Matt and Leo.